the next item, we are um, having a special education report. Uh, this was actually something we had originally wanted to have a report last spring and we're delayed, <laughs> um, but for, good um, reasons. for very, very good reasons. Um, but we're glad that we're finally um, getting a chance to hear about the, the issues at special education. Sure. So um, I brought a, a few of my friends tonight. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so just to go a little bit over, I guess it'll take a moment to get queued up. Um, one of the slides is introducing folks, so I'll just take the opportunity now. So we have several of our um, special ed coordinators who are our special ed administrators here. And we have Chris Carlson, who's our out of district coordinator. Um, we have Craig Haas, who is an elementary coordinator who's new this year. Um, Stephanie Greiner, who in the past has been a team chairperson, but is the Audison middle school coordinator. And Elizabeth <coughs> Logue is a new elementary coordinator. And Joyce Schlinger, who has been here as our um, early childhood coordinator or preschool director. Uh, Lynn Bennett, the high school coordinator, was unable to come tonight. Um, we also have staff who are going to present. And we have Megan Burke, who is a social worker over at Dallin. Um, Joanna Dimmick, that is Dimmick or Dimmick? Dimmick, that's what I thought. Uh, uh, who is our BCBA, um, who works in several of our schools, but specifically with the program over at Dallin. Thad Digman, who you know is the principal at Dallin. And then we have Mogali Olander and um, Lauren Peterson, who are a uh, social worker and speech and language pathologist at the High School Reach program. So and now we're ready to go. So um, again, those were just recognizing um, part of what we call our special ed leadership team. We also have team chairpersons who are AEA uh, members, but we do find that they are leaders in our special ed program, programming as well. Um, uh, just an overview of the programming that we have here in the district. So we start as early as three-year-olds. So the Monotomy Preschool is an integrated preschool program. Um, under the federal regulations, we are required to start serving students as young as age three when they're identified. Um, but we run an integrated preschool program for students ages three to five, and that um, combines uh, students who receive special ed services with um, typical peer role models as well. At the elementary level, we have supported learning centers, which are our, you know, what we would call our special ed programs or sub-separate programs. Um, we have them at Brackett, which serves students with intellectual disabilities, Dallin serving students with social emotional needs, and Stratton serving students with autism spectrum disorders. Those programs continue through middle and high school. Um, their names change. Um, wasn't here for the history of that name change, but they uh, become Compass, uh, which uh, again serves students with intellectual disabilities, REACH, which serves students with autism spectrum disorders and social cognition and pragmatic needs, and Summit, which serves students with social emotional needs. Um, just some stats about it, the district. We have, uh, as of uh, last week when we pulled this data, 873 students receiving special ed services. Um, Eight, 742 of those students we serve in district, uh, 108 of them we serve in out of district placements. Uh, we also have what's called services only. Um, under our child find obligations, we are required to um, affirmatively find um, and serve students in the Arlington community who um, are eligible for special ed services, even if their parents have parentally placed them at private schools. So we do serve 23 students. Um, who come in just for services. Um, there's more that are eligible. Currently, 23 students take advantage of that service. Um, again, as I said, at Monotomy, we have um, 34 students uh, who are in our special ed program and then 40 typical uh, peers. And then we also serve an additional 21 students through drop-in services. They may be in private preschools. They may be at home. They just come in for um, individual services and don't have what we call as a seat at the program. Um, and then you can see the totals for the other schools. Um, I, I put an asterisk next to the ones that have programs. You'll see that those schools tend to have higher special ed populations. Obviously, we've concentrated um, programs there, so there would be a higher incidence of students with disabilities. Um, in our out-of-district placements, uh, 31 students are served in public day placements, which are known as our special ed collaboratives. We are members of uh, EDCO and uh, Lab Collaborative. However, we have students in CASE Collaborative, SEAM Collaborative, 
um, possibly Valley Collaborative. Um, so those are considered public day placements. Another 60 students are served in private day placements, which are the Massachusetts approved private schools. Um, and then 14 students are in residential placements, and then two students we have being served through home hospital, uh, meaning at their home, they are not able to attend school. Um, we have an additional, because of uh, some of the group homes in the town, we do serve as programmatic, um, programmatically responsible for students who are in out-of-district placements. We don't have a fiscal responsibility for them. Their home district does, but so we have an additional four students in public day placements, three in private day, and then um, another student in special ed in institutional settings. Um, one of the things that I've mentioned uh, in previous uh, uh, meetings is that we this is our year for the coordinated program review. That's conducted every six years by the Department of Ele Elementary and Special Ed Secondary Education. Um, they're going to review civil rights, English language education, and special education. Uh, the review consists of two main parts. Last spring, uh, we all participated in what's the self-assessment. It's an online um, assessment which we review our own records, submit the findings from our record review. We also then go through our policy and procedure upload where we have to, for special education, we have 57 criteria that we need to report on. Um, Dr. Chesson has been handling it for civil rights and Carla Bruzzese has been handling it for um, English language education. They will now be on site um, in November to do the second part. Um, they'll do an additional record review on site, which is more spot checking um, of the records, and then they will be visiting um, our schools. The, they will be making site visits, not to necessarily observe instruction, but to look at the equity of our instructional spaces, the groupings of students, the size and location of uh, where we deliver services. And then they'll also use that time to um, interview staff and they'll meet with administrators, teachers, uh, teacher assistants, related service providers um, to interview them to, and that's where they're gonna really see, you know, are the policies and procedures that we said we have in place actually, you know, what we're practicing. They also will interview um, the CPAC, uh, representative sample from the CPAC. Uh, parents who wish to give per, uh, input can and have been submitting their names. They'll receive um, a phone interview after the site visit. Uh, any student whose record was reviewed, their families will also receive a survey. Uh, and again, just the timeline. They'll be here for the record review November 15th and 16th, and that's where they'll actually be physically up here just going through the records. Um, and at that time, they'll be reviewing special ed and English language learner student records. Uh, and then they will be back on site uh, the week after Thanksgiving to conduct their site visits. There'll be three individuals who come and uh, divide up the schools and the visits on those three days. Um, as I mentioned, they'll conduct phone interviews with interested families in December. Uh, about two to three months after the visit, we can anticipate a uh, draft report. We will have 10 days to respond to that report and correct any factual inaccuracies and then they'll issue a final report within four to six months after their visit. If there are findings and we are issued corrective action, we all have 20 days to submit our um, corrective action plan. Um, tonight, what the teachers are here to present about, and when we ask about what is the work that special ed has been doing um, over the last few years since I've been here, we've really started to work on program development. A lot of time was spent developing the program, uh, programs that we have maybe six to eight at this point, 10 years ago probably is when it really started. Um, so now it seems that we're at a natural time where we can review the programs, look how the population has shifted or changed. Um, and we have been working with Wadiko Children's Services to do that. Uh, Wadiko is based out of Boston. Some people might be familiar. They do have a residential school in New Hampshire and summer program, but they also have consulting services uh, where they work with school-based teams. One of the things that um, really has been a, a nice fit with us is that 
unlike typical consultants where they'll come in, they might interview people, they might make observations, and then they'll submit you a list of recommendations and kind of leave. Um, what they really do is they work with our team so that our teams are doing the assessments of their own programs. Our teams are planning the interventions. They're researching you know, the interventions, planning the implementation. And WDECO is really facilitating that process. So in that way, it's professional development for our staff so that we don't always need WDECO to help us with that. And, um, Dallin has really gotten to the point where they're at their own self-assessment stage, having worked with them for close to two years now. So um, I'm going to turn it over to the teams I just did, wanted to add. We originally started with um, Dallin, the Summit Program at Audison, and then um, Millbrook and Reach at the high school. That was in our first year. And now we have um, the consultants working with all three of the SLCs at elementary reaching summit at Audison and working with all the four programs at the high school. So do you, Dallin, want to start? Or did you want to? You're all going together. Yeah. Okay, great. I mean, it's a collaborative model. So again, my name is Megan Burke. I'm one of the social workers who works over at the Dallas School, specifically with the Supported Learning Center. I'm Magali Olander, social worker in the REACH, which is the Autism Spectrum Program program uh, profile program at the high school. And I'm Lauren Peterson, the speech and language pathologist at the high school. And Joanna Demick is our BCBA, who works across the district, but will join us kind of when when it's up and she is ready. Um, so we have about the next 10 minutes together to talk about um, our shared experiencing um, with programming and program development through the WDECO consultation. Um, and just to start a conversation, we understand that this is a pretty brief time period and we'd love to continue the conversation along with anyone who is interested in having it. Um, we, as we think about kind of launching into this conversation, we thought it could be helpful to start with a couple of questions for you, which you do not have to answer. You can just think amongst yourselves of what do you already know about the special education programming in town, um, how they're structured, supported, resourced, um, what do the programs do, and what interventions do the programs use? Text support. Oh, text on support. <laughs> Um, tech support is on the way. So um, specifically, we realized that our SLC, SLC students cut across diagnostic criteria, and the important functional concern is their inability to access the curricula due to a variety of needs that require some significant support in a substantially separate setting, and that can um, provide a continuum of support. So one of the things that I think is often a misconception is that a, a substantially separate setting may mean that a child doesn't include at all, and really we see a majority of our kids including in a range of supports in both the general ed and special ed settings kind of across our days. And the programming in district, that number was really cool to see how many kids are in district. Yeah. Continues to let the students receive all the specialized support and then have access to the richness that public schools provide. We see that so much at the high school with the, with the different curricula that are available at the different levels and the enrichment stuff, um, which is nice for our students to access. Oh, um, ah, we're off. So, so guys, um, that is a microphone. It won't actually amplify your voice, but if you could speak into it when you're talking that way, it gets to the uh, TV. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. On TV. <laughs> you're on TV. You're on TV. You're on TV. Yes. Oh, you do. Cool. Nice. Um, all right. So the uh, Wadiko came in, um, and, I, and I'll be honest, we were a little hesitant when this started. For those of us who have been in district for um, a couple of years, we've been through a couple of models of consultation, um, and we said, okay, like we'll buy in, but we need to see some action and some change. Um, and I have to say that this was a really empowering process, specifically for our two teams. Um, and they introduced the idea of the logic model, um, where we began with an assessment of student needs and then conceptualized some program models, some interventions and to meet those targeted needs and then some evaluation um, and the Dallin team I think is the one team in district that has gotten to that phase um, and it was really fascinating to see with fidelity that we were implementing all of these things that we said we were going to be implementing and very and exciting I mean we certainly had growth areas and areas to move from 
but the ability to go through this process and then to realize that this is a process we can continue going through on our own was a really powerful experience. So I'll let the, the REACH team jump in on what the process looked like. Again, uh, if you just we'll move the mic right. Yeah, excellent. All right. <laughs> Perfect. So um, Wadiko, the logic model that Wadiko sort of offers as a frame moves you through a process of identifying needs, figuring out what is already going in, figuring out what the programs are supposed to be putting out, giving back to the students and the community, the needs of that community, and then what are the outcomes? What is, what's happening? Is it working? And that sort of follows the, that circular diagram that Megan just showed, but it's a very organizing and structured way of thinking about the work that we're doing, and it really did prove to be quite helpful at, at organizing our thinking and, and structuring our, our, next, our, our next steps. So as we think about how this was helpful for us, taking um, one of the biggest focuses we've had is having our program become structure dependent versus person dependent. So God forbid one of us runs off to Hawaii or something like that. Everything is still up and running. Um, and so it was really helpful identifying needs. So we have program specific orientations that have been supported by the district before school starts. So our staff start the year ready to go. Um, we have determined program-wide professional development from levels to TAs to teaching assistants to BSPs or so behavior support personnel to our related service providers working with the programs. And we've identified needs around staffing, physical space. Um, we've really learned to prioritize and carve out time for meetings to be able to continue this work within our school days. Um, and so it was, it was helpful to um, identify what we're currently doing, identify what we want to be doing, and then have some good data to come back to our administrators who are supporting us through this process to help kind of advocate for those resources. And while the steps of the logic model look rather basic and simple, there were many, many other steps along the way within each of those that really, really broke down skills into very small pieces and, and all the elements of our program. So when we were looking at student needs, we were breaking things down into you know, some of the most minimal, smallest interventions that we're putting in place and was able to give us a really good perspective, even though it's the things that we're doing every single day with all of our students, but to be able to see how much of that impact we're doing and why. I mean, we were consistently asked throughout the process, but why are you doing those? How do you know that those are the right interventions? What are the outcomes that we're seeing? Are they effective and how to do that? And it was a really nice process to help us see all of those small pieces as we look to the big picture. It was, um, it was fascinating because both the Wadigo consultant and our special ed administrator at the time, Chris Carlson, came in for two days to evaluate us and we had to provide artifacts. So it couldn't just be like, oh yeah, no, we're doing that. Um, we had to be able um, to show them through kind of documentation and meeting with a, a multiple of you know, family, students, staff working in the program. So it was, you know, in my 15 years in, in this career of clinical social work in school settings, it's the first time somebody's asked me to go through this process. It was a, it was a pretty meaningful experience for us. I think one of the most valuable pieces was the staff interviews where we asked staff about their impressions and their knowledge of all of the pieces and the fidelity with which they felt that we were performing those things as opposed to just the artifacts showing it. And, and the staff impressions, all of us across the board actually were far more critical of ourselves than what the actual facts showed and the actual artifacts were able to say, look, we are actually doing that and we're doing it actually a lot better than we even think that we are. And then I think um, the outcome of it is it launched us into this year with some really nice data-driven goals um, of where we want to grow, where we want to learn, where we want to further develop ourselves. Um, and so I think being in slightly different places in this process, it was interesting to come together to think about this talk and just to think about kind of the impact in moving forward and kind of how it affects all of us. Um, just thinking about the the dedicated time and reflection, the time that we got to really think about how our programs are structured, um, what do we need to move forward, and having that time built into our schedule and somebody kind of motivating us to go forward and think about it really specifically. Um, thinking about our program structure and the needs, the development of short-term and long-term action steps, like they were talking about really starting the year with some really concrete goals. And then um, just keeping being collaborative and consistently reviewing and um, thinking of it as kind of a working document that we're constantly thinking about this data and moving forward with the progress of the students, the families, and obviously the staff and teachers in the schools. 
Um, and as they were saying, thinking about a programmatic approach versus um, just like a person-dependent model. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Please you. Please come see us anytime. <laughs> we might. <laughs> I, I, I have a quick question. What, um, how did um, you end up partnering with this organization? Is that, how did that come to you guys? So um, I've worked with Widico for the last 14 years. Originally, I started working with them in Boston and then um, continued the partnership in Reading where I worked. And so um, in part because of this particular work mm -hmm. that they do, um, I think it really, again, works for the long haul so that we are empowering our staff to, to continue to look as student populations change and grow, expand, um, you know, shift a little right of what we used to be doing, maybe shift a little left of what we used to be doing. It gives us a way to respond to the needs versus always saying, oh, we need to create a new program mm -hmm. or we need to add more of this. I think one of, you know, I've learned to trust the process um, through several iterations of working with them because my fear is always like, they're gonna come back and they're gonna ask for 500 new staff to do X, <laughs> Y, and Z. And without fail, every time they kind of look at what they're doing and realize by organizing their schedule and their existing resources and whatnot, they're able to tackle, like you said, you realize you're doing a lot more than you, you think you are and when you're doing it in a targeted way, you're um, using our resources a little bit more effectively. Yes, Mr. Hainer. Uh, this may be for you, but maybe for Dr. But you mentioned that uh, we're one of four or five communities that are going to be uh, required to deal with a lot of out-of-district students in the future. Will that impact your programs? So there's a question about uh -huh. the ESSA legislation. Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yes. So we'll find out more um, what that exactly means. So it's a the federal um, law was signed in a year ago, I guess. So it takes effect in December, certain portions of it. Um, the state itself hasn't necessarily figured out exactly how that's going to play out and exactly who's going to have fiscal responsibilities, but things will shift um, between McKinney-Vento, where students were originally covered under the Homeless um, you know, Education Act. Um, students that were previously awaiting foster care will no longer be considered homeless, and they will shift over to the label of foster care, which will have implications under this ESSA legislation. So we'll know more as we get closer to December. The reason I bring this up is that it could be burdensome on our budget and things of that nature and affect other programs. And I, I, I don't want it to diminish anything. I, I feel it's important that we meet our obligations, but at the same time, the idea of being one of four or five communities in the whole Commonwealth is, am I wrong in saying that? It affects the whole Commonwealth. It's right. just that in terms of the number of uh, group home beds, we have more than as many other communities. The other question I have for you, it, the Millbrook, uh, the out of district placement, the numbers that you have there, does that r reflect all the Millbrook services? Millbrook is um, a general education program, so I did not reflect them in this special okay. education okay. presentation. Um, my concern is with, with all the homes that we do have in town and the burden, my understanding from Different, that, that that program may be in going down below the high school uh, if, they, if, if it, did we staff it prob uh, properly. Am I, I wrong in that assumption? I think we're kind of far out on that decision making. I, I don't know we're, that we're at that stage. Well, right now the program is located in the uh, central school. Right. Yes, and we have, it's a general ed program. Right. And where it will reside down the road is uh, remains to be seen. But for this year, they will be there. But part but of, the, it, part of their, their charge is assessing. And some of those students, after the assessment, could become part of your program yeah. as well as general ed. Oh, correct. And correct, correct. I guess when I say expanding, the, the age group in some of the homes may, may be going down. And I'm just concerned that we have the proper staffing and not overburden the existing staffing we have. That's all. We will be real sensitive to that as, as we go forward, for sure. Thank you. Uh, yes, Tasha Sampi. Um, I have a couple, for, uh, a couple comments. Um, first, thank you very much for including the abbreviation for the start of your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> no, because we always hear these alphabet soup things. Oh, yeah. I never right. see them written out. It's really helpful, and if parents are interested, they'll get <coughs>
just wondering how we could get more information on these programs, the different ones, and how well we're <coughs> meeting the children's needs. I don't know if this would be part of, will come out as part of the uh, coordinated program review, or? Um, I think you would see that, so when, as they mentioned, they've co completed their program evaluation. Um, they got to that phase of it, so I think that's the kind of information will give us. One of the other products that we have asked teams to create is a handbook. Um, so that reflects when they talked about targeting the needs of students um, very specific to their programming. Um, I think we've kind of done the umbrella of, oh, they have emotional impairment. They've qualified under emotional impairment, which is the disability category um, under the DESE. However, you know, when they really started to look at the student's profile and looking at the evaluation results, the family history, the outside survey, like really getting a much more nuanced picture of what students um, present with. And so part of their evaluation or part of the logic model really calls for them to, to do that on a, a very specific level. So, you know, saying that our students have anxiety and complex trauma history, you know, this is kind of how we've said students with um, autism spectrum disorders and those with social cognition and pragmatic needs, because maybe they don't have the, you know, disability category of autism, but they do have social and pragmatic needs. So they've really kind of distilled the profile of the student they're servicing. And once they've done that is when they start to then research what are the research-based interventions for these particular, you know, um, profiles and needs. So those exist to a degree in their handbooks. Um, I'm wary of putting, um, really hard <laughs> defined borders on some of this stuff because we do need to make sure that we're being individualized and we and we can't restrict someone just because they don't necessarily fit all of the criteria and whatnot so um you know we have kind of larger overarching uh descriptors of the programs uh on the website i, I guess what i'm thinking is just how well are our programs meeting our children's needs that that's kind of the part that i'm really curious about I guess I, I, I guess you'd have to define needs. So I, I think there's many indicators we look at, and one of the things that they develop in the program models is, you know, what are going to be our indicators? You know, simply saying are they meeting grade level expectation may provide one type of indicator, but they're not necessarily that doesn't, you know, address the host of other issues say that a student with social cognition need, uh, has because you know what they're also looking at how are they engaging in relationships with their peers and adults and some of that stuff is qualitative but we're trying to look to make it more quantitative and that's part of the work that they're doing so I don't have an answer specifically of we're meeting needs yes <laughs> or we're meeting needs no I think it's a little more nuanced than just a yes or a no so if you had specific questions maybe they can answer it I guess I'm having a hard time does it sound like, um, I, I know that there are some documentation that you're, you're, you're getting. Is one of the questions, is there something that we will see later on? Yeah, you know, that, that sort of a summary of some of the documentation that you're doing from this process and others. Sure, we can. Maybe that's, that's that. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I yeah. Want, sorry. Yeah. And then one other thing I'm just trying to put in everyone's heads that as we go forward with rolling the Gibbs out as the new sixth grade only school, um, I am still concerned that the special education department was the ones who felt the most strongly that it wasn't a good idea um, and that there is concern about transition and I'm not sure if there were concerns beyond that but I would love you to be thinking and helping us understand what can we do to make it the best possible experience for your students not just for the general education students um, and um, I'm thinking specifically of transitions as school students come from elementary to Gibbs and then from Gibbs to Audison. How can we make that better for them? And is it, you know, is there things that we need to be building into this space? Is there, or, or anywhere, you know, is, is it additional equipment that we need or do we need to think about moving people, transitioning people along with a class, you know, so they're basically rolling up with the class? Um, I just, I'd like us to have that as part, as we start the Gibbs process, that we have, we always have that idea in mind. So, thank you. Mr. Cardin. Uh, thank you, and, and congratulations on the team. I hear a lot, I, I'm a, da a Dallin parent, so I hear a lot of good things about the Dallin team. 
uh, and everything that's going on there with the uh, SLC program there. Um, I, I think what maybe what Kiersey was looking at is um, it, it sounds like this, this evaluation process is coming up with some things that maybe you might need to do a little bit differently or things, you know, recommendations for improvements or things like that. If we could just get a summary of sort of what's been recommended and what's been implemented or things like that, not at a detailed level, but. Sure, so I mean, some of the things are, well, they've already talked about. So in the first iteration of the um, <coughs> logic model, they identified that staff need to be trained prior to the start of the school year. So then they created a summer orientation program. Right. So those are the kind of yep. things yeah. that um, but come out of it. the other programs, you know, maybe just keep a running yep. summary of that kind of stuff. Sure. That would be very helpful. Thanks. Um, uh, and then the only other, just more general comment is, it's actually the same same idea there was the staff training the only thing that I've been hearing from from parents is there are some new team chairs that have never had that role before and there's a little bit of a rocky start of the school year so let's just make sure that they're supported Mr. Thielman. Your coordinators are right over there do you hear that guys <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, I think the sixth grade issue was that there was it, it, it but just having one grade, it made it more difficult to follow a student throughout the three years. You know, you could, it was, might be more difficult, more challenging to develop a relationship with a student who uh, in, was in school for just one year in the sixth grade if they were on an IEP. That was maybe the concern we heard from some people. Um, specifically, I think some parents, I don't know if they're the same ones who have spoken concern. to you, okay. so have spoken to me about this idea of, yeah. you know, have you ever considered having the staff kind of loop so that, yeah. you know, they're not meeting new staff when they get then to the 7-8 program at Audison. Um, you know, I haven't run that by the teachers. I, I think they might have some thoughts about, you know, their own um, relationships with adults and whatnot and the team that they develop yeah. at the sixth grade level or at any grade level. I mean, Jason could probably, you know, speak to, you know, the, the teams that develop um, at the different grade levels and within the clusters. Yeah. Mr. Lee? I just found over the years continuity of the teams being together for several years it builds a better relationship and it's better for the students mm -hmm. and I just feel that it's really great to have the same teams for several years mm -hmm. instead of changing every single year because that puts more time for teachers where we have to have more meetings and try to gel together right. when we've already had a previous mm -hmm. relationship and work well together yeah well, I mean, I just as the sixth grade model is evolving, yeah. I mean, I guess the point I want to make is to just keep us informed of mm -hmm. how the special education program yep. is going to be developed. And, mm -hmm. yes. So, yes, I, I'm going to Kathy yeah. because we Yeah, so that, that's, and at some point, I think, yeah, that. at some point we should, we should sort of get a report on the sixth grade mm -hmm. plan. Yeah. The other thing, you know, a question that, that, that um, town leadership often asks is, you know, uh, is the percentage or the number of students on IEPs increasing or decreasing over time? Um, I didn't least, prepare that. that yeah, I know, you, um, I know you didn't. That's I, kind of I, I, my understanding is, I mean, at least since I've been here, it's relatively consistent. The, yeah. um, you know, the number, the overall number hasn't actually creeped up as much as the population itself has creeped up, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we could get that for no. you. I mean, I, it, it's a question that, trend, that often, yeah. at budget time, when we visit the other <laughs> side of the street. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's a question about that. I can tell you that in the last four years at Dallin, we have um, graduated children to less restrictive settings every single year, which Good. has been something we've really enjoyed celebrating. Good for you. Great. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. I have a sure. big picture question. Uh, where do you see special education Arlington going in the next five years? or 10 years That's or whatever. That's a very big picture question. Yeah, big picture. Um, I mean, I think we're investing in our programs, but uh, Thad and I were just talking this morning, um, where I really think special education needs to go, and Laura and I have had these conversations, is really working with general ed, because you don't change special ed by changing special ed. <laughs> you change special ed by addressing general ed. So I would really like to see us looking at multi-tiered systems of support and looking at what, what we're doing in tier one, with the, those foundational things that all students are getting so that when we are targeting kids at the you know, second and third tiers of support that you know, it really is targeted. Um, and that we last year we asked for um, additional learning specialists so we could expand co-teaching. I think you know, that is another way to address some of this gen eds and special ed support is by these co-teaching partnerships and co-teaching can take different forms. You know, it can be 
two teachers in a room all day changing roles you know you're doing this session this and there's different ways to do it and so I think you know with the addition of staff that so that we could develop those relationships truly um, you know that's where I would like to see us going um, I'd like us to keep us kids in district <laughs> um, I would like to see that you know we have the capacity you know we've talked about um, the programs are really strong but they're also they have capacity issues there's uh, you know there's finite space for programs but then there's also you know what staff can do with the resources mm -hmm. they have so um, okay great thank you um okay uh we have thank you very much buffer zone do we have oh yes Thank you.